Monday, September 6th. I'm Scott. I'm Rem. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we interview Mark O'Sullivan of Vanilla Forums. Let's do this. Man, we're finally back from PAX. No, we're not. Yeah, we, we are. We go to PAX. All right, name for me one awesome thing that happened at PAX 2010. The uh, Friday night PAX Late Show All was right. totally awesome. What we happened? had uh, John St. John as the guest. All right, name one thing he said. He said it's time to kick ass and chew bubble gum. Name one and thing I'm he said that he did not that you that you could not that possibly I, predict that he would say. You realize this is flawed because whatever I say, I could go back in time and have him say it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean go forward in time and have him say it. So PAX was awesome. We uh we did our two panels and we did the late show. And if any of you are new You know you're jinxing it because you know we're gonna fail to do them somehow. And then these people are gonna be coming, you know, today after PAX to hear about it because they found out about us from the late show. Yeah, no, it's 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 still August thirtieth. No, it's uh Monday, September sixth. Anyway. Labor Day. The you the listeners know. I don't know. No, I don't, they don't. They don't I don't need to continue to fight for them to know the truth. They they the know truth it. that you for some reason decided like in the fourth take of this to continue to insist <laughs> that it's still before PAX. <laughs> it's not even necessary. Everybody knows it. You know, it'll be really funny if like that hurricane prevents us from flying to PAX I don't three think days I don't ago. think it's gonna. I don't think it will. <laughs> so it is Monday, but we got to get into this interview pretty quick because I think it's going to be pretty fun. So what do you got? Oh, we want to do some news. Yeah, it is Monday. So um, the least done Geek Nights night in a while. Yeah. So uh, you know, AMD bought ATI a while ago. That they did. That they did. And now the news is out that uh, not only did they buy ATI, which <laughs> they was done a long time ago, but now they're actually going to destroy the ATI brand. That was expected. So now you're gonna buy an. It's still gonna. They're still gonna keep around like Radeon and shit. They're just gonna not call it ATI. So it's gonna be an AMD Radeon video card. I have nothing. I mean, I think it's a great plan from their perspective. It'll just solidify the AMD brand. Why bother also marketing this ATI that no one's gonna remember? Yeah, in I like think six it'll. Months? I think it'll really cut down on people buying AMD CPUs with NVIDIA GPUs because it's like. They really try to emphasize that fusion thing they have going on, yeah. you know, and then so you're going to buy the AMD set as opposed to like Intel and NVIDIA, which still kind of hate each other, but they really should team up with each other for their own benefit. Well, but they is, hate each other. It is also definitely kind of a sign that they're going to probably move more and more toward crazy integrations. I mean, I could really foresee them eventually selling like GPU, CPU, motherboard combo all in one. This some, that is one thing I never understood, right? Is like, okay, you're putting these uh, integrated GPUs into the CPU, right? Why don't you just remove the PCI X16 slot from the motherboard and in, in that same space, just put the GPU right on the motherboard? So here's like the a problem. real one. Here's the problem. One, it does cut down on, like, it'll make it more difficult to manufacture because the video card technology moves a lot faster than the rest. That's true. And now you can't upgrade. Uh, it's true. Well, you could upgrade if they also put the slot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you could deactivate the one on the motherboard and put a new one in the slot. But that's like we do now. The thing is, the vast majority of people don't want to upgrade. Uh, it depends, though. The people who buy an AMD, who know to buy a particular motherboard. That's true. That's true. But I mean, normal people don't know. They don't care. They go buy a Dell. Yeah, but, you know, right, does Dell In fact, even, even people like have us... Have an AMD option nowadays? God, even people like us buy a Dell half the time now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I built my computer from scratch because I had some requirements, and I could have gotten pretty much the same thing from, like, Dell or someone for pretty the, much the same money. The problem is people always, when they go to Dell or whoever, they always look at the consumer brand models or they look at the gaming models. Oh, I wish I could buy the ones I've got at work at home. Yeah, you're supposed to look at the business models. Any company that pre-builds computers, the only good ones are the business models. Like Lenovo, all the business class ThinkPads are awesome and everything else sucks. Dell, the Optiplexes, the business ones, those are pretty good. Uh, and the other I wouldn't ones say are... every other Lenovo sucks, though. They're actually pretty consistent. Wait, you want to get the Pad, the cheap plastic piece of crap? It's not that bad. It's pretty bad. For its price point, not that it bad. It is pretty bad. I would not buy one. Name another laptop that competes with it at that price point. 
Uh, what do you mean? At the same price? Yeah, like at the same price. Can you get a better laptop elsewhere? You can't get a good laptop for that price is the point. So why not get the best one at that price? Don't get any. Uh, what if you don't have enough money but you need a laptop? It's not that bad. Don't get, don't get, you're gonna, it's gonna break and you're actually gonna end up spending more money in the long run than if you would have bought a good one in the first place. They're not that unreliable. They're, everyone I ever known who has bought the lower end laptops has always had them cracking and breaking and all kinds of troubles. And the only people I know who have laptops that are reliable are Apple people who spend too much money and people who buy the high quality. I've actually laptops. found that people I know who have Apples tend to have problems that require them to get it replaced by Apple fairly frequently. Well, those are people who are just, you know, they're going to break whatever computer you give them because they drop it or kick it or do stupid crap to it. Or, I know. remember I knew one person, no no names, who would leave an Apple MacBook kind of cracked open with the speakers on to play music in the shower. Yeah, that is a bad idea. That one I don't think actually broke from that, though. Did it break? Uh, eventually. Uh -huh. I think it was an unrelated <laughs> physical defect. Uh-huh. Okay, good job. Unless I hope that's a real cold shower because the humidity is going to... No, 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 no. Okay. So, I mean, I guess we'll have to wait and see how this pans out. There's no other news than, yeah, they're destroying the ATI brand, and I didn't even see a lot of fanboy like craziness about it. Well, because I don't think fanboys really care about the name so much. Now, had they changed it from radio, They care about the benchmarks. Else, I think those fanboys might have gotten a little mad, but... I wouldn't be surprised if in the long run they drop the Radeon brand and have some brand new brand. Well, you know, they, look, they, they already have, uh, they're just using the existing ones, right? The thing that is interesting is that they're keeping the red color. They're not changing it to green, right? Which Because then it'll be green versus green, AMD versus AMD. No, Nvidia. it'll be Christmas. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got an article here, and it's interesting because say that I think People who are old in IT and computer science are discriminated against in the job force. There's a million articles pointing out that, yes, in fact, if you're over 40, you're not going to get hired for IT or CS. But if I decide the exact opposite, that young people are being discriminated against, there's the same number of articles saying that no one hires the inexperienced out-of-college people. That's true. I I'm pretty sure that no one hires anyone at this point. No, Pete, there is one kind of person that's hired. 24, single, no prospects of a relationship, family, or future, willing to work 60 mm. hours. Well, that, that helps. But, I mean, it's pretty much, it's, they don't, very, only certain places, you know, and not enough of them will hire the completely inexperienced college person, right? But as soon as the person goes to one of those places, if they manage to get there, then they can get a real job yeah, at, some, at a place. And then they can have real jobs for a certain period of time until they're old and their skills are washed out. And then it's hard for them to get jobs if they lose it again. But you, what you have to do in that time is like, you know, go out on your own or become a fancy consultant or become so awesome in some way that you're going to be all right. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't elevate, work admin, if you don't elevate 40, 50, it's going to be tough. Even if you're awesome, I'll be honest, I don't think people hire older people because they know they can get more out of a younger person. You have to elevate during the short time that you have to, to something bigger, like being a manager or something, be, you know, maybe a something. It's got to be something besides the low-end guy. You can't be the low-end guy after you're that old. You got to well, be working up. Well, actually, here's the thing. Uh, it just, at least in my experience and having worked, you know, for three big iron companies and never worked anywhere small ever... This article, I bring it up for the news partly because it talks about this kind of ageism problem where young and old people in technology, I think, are discriminated against often unfairly. I mean, very young people have tons of awesome knowledge. Like, they know whatever's hip and current now, usually. At least if they went to a good school or they're really motivated. But uh, companies won't really hire them because they want, you know, they always say, like, I want five years of experience with this thing that's only existed for three years. <laughs> but that's the real problem there is that non-tech people write the job listings. Mm -hmm. So the real advice is ignore experience requirements and apply anyway. Yeah, I don't, you know, I think that's... In fact, don't lie, but count college years as experience. Well, I think the thing is, is that just, yeah, a lot of people are scared away they're like afraid to apply. If you're looking for a job in technology or anything else, right? Just look at if it sounds like a job that you want, don't look at the requirements. Don't look at any of that bullshit, right? Just if it sounds like a job and that's the job you want, apply. It doesn't cost anything to apply. If it does, don't apply no matter what. Oh, uh, I would argue if you have, if you live in some barbaric place like Australia where you have to pay for your bandwidth in a metered way, it costs to send that email. A very a negligible amount, <laughs> right? The point is, it doesn't cost anything to apply. So even if you don't meet the requirements at all, like you're not even close, 
apply anyway. What's the worst they can do? Not email you back? Oh, no, they didn't email me back at the end of the world. Listen, <laughs> just email. It doesn't hurt. Do it. And then, some, you know, maybe they're probably, I imagine, if they have stupid requirements, they're not getting that many emails. So the competition will be light, if nil, and they might call you back. They might. Why not? You know, and it, it pretty much it pretty it comes down to whether are you desperate for a job, any job, then freaking shotgun, you know, boom, blast your resume all over the place. So you get a job. Don't spam it, though. No, no, no. Just, you know, you know, those people it's who a like shotgun. actually it, spam. You, you gotta, don't want to do that. It's a shotgun. You can't just go doom, 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 doom. You got to get one shot and hit the clay pigeon. Right? Yeah, but don't email like the operations number of a company and say, I have an H-1B and I know Java. Please hire me to do your Java project. Yeah. You know how many emails those I get every single day? <laughs> They're almost always the same email, just with a different name. But if you are, you know, if you can, if you got money and you, you don't need a job right away and you're looking for the good job and you're willing to stay at home and do nothing until you find the good job, then you can get your sniper rifle out, right? And just go, ding! <laughs> <laughs> Metaphorical ding. sniper rifle. Don't go shoot anyone. No. But here's why I want to link to this article, and I think it's worth... I think a show on ageism might be worth doing later, but this article, every time you see an article that talks about like how to fight ageism and how to like how to get a job in tech if you're over 40 or nowadays over 30, <laughs> they always say, you know, be really current in your skills and be able to demonstrate it. And that's BS. This article says what I would say. If you want to still be relevant when you're getting into your 40s and 50s and you're an IT or a CS guy, I'm just going to quote the quote from Slashdot. One, Move up the ladder into management, architecture, or design. Do not stay at just coding or IT. Mm. Because there's basically no future in those, in, no matter how old you are. <laughs> Two, if you're going to stay in programming, realize that the deck is stacked against you and deal with that. Three, actually keep your skills current. Actually current. Know what people are actually doing. I mean, if, you're, if you want to get a job now in like web or something and you can't do pretty much any common framework just off the drop of a hat, you're already screwed. Yeah. Unless you want to get one of those, like, Enterprise, Tomcat, Java. Well, I mean, yeah, it also depends on what you want to... Like, if I want to work in finance, I have to go learn a bunch of j crap I don't know, like Javas or .NETs or something, you know? It's like, you got to aim for the industry where your skill set is going to work out. Yep, but I think the most uh, important advice is really... You've got to move up and to the side into management architecture or into sales, into product uh, management, into consulting, into project management. You said project management two times. Yes. You can also, uh, another good idea is if you learn an additional skill, like you keep all your technology skills way current and awesome, but you also have some other skill that's like way current and awesome. Like finance or medicine or biology, because holy crap, you realize like bioinformatics or anything like that is the hot shit right now. Or even like, even something stupid like sports or fucking, you know, liquor store managing or, you know, anything. You can combine the technology skills with your skills. And the thing is, most people who have the other skill set don't know anything about technology. So you can make a product or, you know, find an existing business and really help it out or who knows what you can do. Yep. But most people who know tech, only know tech professionally, or if they know something else, they don't think that it or would be they, relevant. Or they're in tech, but they don't really know tech. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the most important, like, things on a resume is if you know, like, someone who knows IT and something else, you will basically have perfect job insurance forever. Law. Law's a good one. Yeah. Plus, imagine a world where the lawyers were also able to do their own IT. That's and the doctor understood why Firefox was better than IE. That's, yeah, that's okay. But I think the real thing we need is we need the judges. And that's going to be much more difficult. The judges. So moving right along to get into everything, it's time for the things of the day. Oh, no. Thing of the day. What? I got sick of saying things of the day. I wanted to mix it up. All right, whatever. So, you know, the uh, one of the most famous supercomputers to ever exist was the Cray. And, you know, people back in the day used to be like, oh, my God, Cray. Cray Dad? Cray Fish? No, just Cray. The Cray supercomputer, Claw right? Claw Cray? Why are you being stupid? Anyway, so the thing with the Cray is that it was sort of... I don't know. It was real famous and it was real impressive looking. Like it's if you've ever if you've never seen one, it's like a big cylinder, right, with a hole in the middle, and then it actually has like a bench around it. You know, it's like you know the idea was that you would have it there, and the the programmers would sort of sit next to it, thinking, and then they would go over to the terminal and code. You know, and this is like an, an ancient relic of computing, but it was very important. 
uh, you know, to the world and specifically to the U.S. where, you know, the government bought a whole bunch of them back in the day. Your computer now, though, is way faster than a Cray supercomputer, <laughs> at least the first Cray. Um, but anyway, uh, the thing is, some guy, he went and he made a model of Cray 1, the very first Cray supercomputer. And it's not a full-size model. It's much smaller than the original, but it is very, very accurate to the original. So it's like a little tiny Cray could, you know, sit in a room. Uh, but he went one step beyond that. You know what step beyond that he went to? What he do? He took an FPGA and he made it binary compatible with the Cray One <laughs> supercomputer. <laughs> so if anyone doesn't know what an FPGA is, right? Basically, what it is, it's it's a it's a C, it's a chip, right? And you it's a chip that you can reprogram. So you can let's say I have it's it's a I think it's like a something programmable gate array, right? Fully programmable gate array, something like that. But the way it works is let's say I have like a Pentium one, right? Well, I can do is I can just I can make a, if I have a Pentium one, it's a Pentium one. That's all it is. It can never change. Field programmable gate array. Field programmable gate array. God damn, I was so close. <laughs> anyway, uh, but if you have an FPGA. Right, you can change it into different chips. Like I, I could turn the FPGA into like an AND gate, a big old AND gate. I could turn it into a Pentium One if it's big enough. You know, I could turn it into a Pentium Two if it's big enough. I could turn it into a Pentium you know, Three if it's big enough. I could turn it into like a Power PC or a or a. I could turn it. I could turn it into the same chip that your cell phone has in it. You know, I could turn it into any chip I needed to turn into. I just had to program it to to be that. Now, why don't we use FPGAs in computers? Well, well they're not as efficient. Yeah, they're not as. It's not as fast as, you know, the the chip you have in your computer. So having an actual Pentium 2 is a lot better than having a FPGA program to be a Pentium 2. Um, also, you know, it's hard to get an, F an FPGA has to have enough stuff in it. In order, you know, if it's not big enough or it doesn't have enough, you know, things in it, 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 there might not be possible for it to, you know, turn into certain chips. Plus, imagine the malware you could write if you were able to hack someone's computer that ran on these things. Oh, God, yeah, you could just switch <laughs> someone's chip into doing something else. Good God. Yeah, you don't want to... You, you, mostly these are used for developing and stuff like that, you know, so... But this guy, he took one, and how is he going to get a Cray, the hardware for a Cray 1, right? There was no way he could do it. That would be so difficult. So, But what he could do is he could get the documentation for a Cray 1 to see how it works, and then he could take an FPGA and program it to be exactly the same as the Cray 1. You know, And you could do this for any sort of chip that's like missing in the world. Like You could t make an NES out of one or you know whatever you need. So that's what he did. And he put it inside the model of a Cray 1, and it's all, and there's a whole bunch of pictures and everything, and it's way awesome. So you all know, at uh, PAX this past weekend, we did the late show. You mean PAX this next weekend. And we had, you know, theoretically, some sort of set, but it was a very ghetto set compared to the kind of sets you see on, like, Watch, Saturday Night we Live. Get, we get there, and it's an all-fancy set. What are you gonna do? <laughs> You're going to be so wrong. Because I know I was there. <laughs> you weren't there yet. On Friday yet. night, last weekend. You weren't there yet. <laughs> So, this is a video, a short video. Uh, I'm sorry it's on Hulu, but this is the best place to get a video like that where it won't get knocked off the internet by copyright. This shows just what it's like for them to change the set on the commercial break on a live show. It's pretty hectic. And now, as Scott pointed out when we watch it together, we, I understand why every time SNL starts up again, the crowd is cheering. Yeah, because like, ooh, they did it. Ooh. The guy's standing there. He's like, come on, 30 seconds. Just get the desk. Just get the desk. And they, come on, just get the desk. And then let's go. And there's like three, two, and then they're good to go. Like, like, the they're like, like they got the desk, and there's like 10 seconds. So the guy like tosses his chair onto the stage. Yep. And then the guy, the actor's like fiddling his wig, 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 wig. And then he starts the skit like right away. Yep. Damn. The thing I don't understand, though, why don't they just have the rotating Les Miserables stage? It would be so I much imagine easier. that's really expensive. But, I mean, they've been doing this show for how many years? How much money do they make? I mean, come on. They could have the rotating stage where they has, like, three sets, and they can set up the set and you know, rotate I, I it into position. I went to a thing where I got to, uh, like, walk on one of those sets and, like, talk to the actors and everything when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. It is hard as fuck to walk straight on that Les Mis set. Yeah, but this that's because in Les Mis, they're wa they don't, you're walking on the thing while it rotates. Oh, exactly. I For know. this, I know. it would be just three positions that were static, and you wouldn't be on it while it was rotating. But you know, Les Mis, they have those scenes where like everyone's walking next to each other. While the prisoners in the chain gang. Look down. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, for the first time in a long time, we are actually doing something we said we would do but did not do, and that is have interviews and more guests on the show. 
So today we have with us uh, someone that you probably don't know, but is very important to at least listeners of this show. You definitely know his work. You know his work. We have with us uh, Mark O'Sullivan, the creator of the Vanilla Forum, which is the forum that we use. Hey, Hey Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. So uh, maybe we should start out, you know, just some basic questions about, you know, vanilla. So to get people uh, on the ball here. So sure. vanilla is obviously an internet discussion, you know, web forum software, right? But obviously. Obviously. Uh, <laughs> why did you, you know, what was the original impetus to, uh, to make it? Sure. Well, so at the time that I, that I started vanilla, I was doing, I had, I had my own discussion forum that I was running for graphic designers and programmers. It was called 08. Hmm. As in uh, the number or the letter O and the number eight. Um, it came out of another forum called dreamless.org. Sorry, it's like a whole uh, history of forums thing that happened many, many years ago. And so my forum, 08, was a, was a sort of a catch all discussion forum for people to get together and talk about whatever the hell they wanted. And it typically was graphic designers and programmers. And we found that all the software that was out there didn't really suit our purposes. We wanted to do a, a, you know, have special features for the forums, and, and they were all kind of one size fits all. And so we started to custom program things here and there, and eventually we got the idea to make a whole plugin framework around it, and and we were able to take something that was really complex and make it very vanilla, and <laughs> and, and then uh, you know introduce r- cool functionality through plugins and, and theming, and and um, run run that community for a really long time, and then uh, eventually all these designers and programmers really wanted to use the software, so they asked if I could open source this, this custom form that I'd written, and, and that's when I released Vanilla in 2005. So it was definitely the functionality driven as opposed to aesthetics driven? Uh, it was a little of both. Like I said, there were designers in the forum, and, and we took a sort of a, a very simple approach, again, another Vanilla approach to the, to the layout. We removed all that bloaty stuff that you see in, in many other discussion forums and, and, uh, and kept it very simple, and, and because of that, it made adding new design kind of easy. So, I mean, you can look at it, a ton of Vanilla One uh, installations, and, and they might look exactly like the default install, but they might look like something you've never seen before. So, we, you know, we've seen it go from being a simple forum to being a project management tool to being a blog to being an issue tracker. At one point, it was uh, the reviewing tool for add-ons for Firefox. Oh, wow, really? I didn't know so, that. So, yeah, it's, I mean, we like to say that you may not have heard of us, but you probably used our software. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so now Vanilla Two is uh, has come out. So, what is the you know big difference between Vanilla Two and Vanilla One? So, we we realized that there was still a lot of ground to be broken in in the forum space and well community discussion space. And, and looking around at all these amazing social networks that were popping up everywhere, we thought, you know, everybody should be able to build one of these. And and so with Vanilla Two, we sort of went at it that way. We also realized, though, that, uh, okay, first of all, there were a lot of improvements that could be made to the plugin framework and theming engine. So we sort of basically rewrote the whole thing from the ground up, and, and you can do a lot more with that now. But more importantly, we realized that um, a lot of forum solutions try to be uh, you know, the full solution for your site. So instead of adding a forum to your site, they want you to, the forum to be your site. And, mm. and uh, we thought it was much more interesting to look at all the platforms that people are using out there, like Drupal and WordPress and, you know, name your CMS. And wouldn't it be really cool if it was just very, very simple to add vanilla to that? And so once your users sign into your existing site, they're automatically signed into vanilla. All the look and feel sort of transfers across. And so that's sort of where we've gone with it. And, and, we're, and beyond that, we're looking at making uh, activity cultivation our, our number one goal. So we want to make sure that if you're running your forum on our software, your users will be more engaged and you will get more organic search traffic. So did you put any thought when you were designing it into the sort of, you know, not to throw on game theory terms, but the mechanism design, like, you know, like BB and all these different kinds of software, they show like post counts and things and they tend to engender a certain kind of behavior. Did you wonder about how your design would cause certain behaviors in the users or is that just completely off the table? No, that, that's absolutely one of the things we played with, even with Vanilla One. We, we wanted to get rid of all the stuff that people were used to and, and try to make them think that, you know, when they look at Vanilla, do they even know it's a forum? Because they have this archetypal idea of what it is and, and what it means to see those things on the screen. Like, we looked at most other forums and we were like, half that information you don't need and it doesn't add value in any way. And so, let's just get rid of it. And, and, don't then, I- and then beyond that, you know, let's, let's look at each... Um, community on a on a one-off basis and and let's see what works for that particular community you know like 
post counts and signatures might make sense on one and might totally not make sense on another. Yeah, I can tell you that's pretty much the, the the reason that I picked vanilla from the beginning was that it didn't have you know each the posts were not gigantic with avatars the you know the size of of you know. <laughs> but King I Kong. need my six hundred pixel animated avatar. You know, Otherwise, and then, and then everyone didn't have a huge animated banner ad signature that showed up over and over again every time they posted a comment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And actually, you know, we 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 do like now now with Vanilla Two, we also have um, Vanilla Forms. Do, well, sorry, VanillaForms.org is where we have the download product. We also we also have VanillaForms.com, which is it's sort of a WordPress model where you know you can go to .com and set up a forum online, and and then we'll you can charge we'll recharge you for extra features. And so we have a lot of forums on running on there, and we're working very closely with a lot of the bigger ones at you know getting that activity cultivation happening. And we found that for some of them. Those giant signatures and and all those little things that you're used to do make sense, but you know they can still be improved upon. So, for example, one of the plugins that we've made recently is a signatures plugin, but it has a bunch of different settings. So, you looking at the forum can decide: Do you want to see any of signatures of your friends or no? And if you do, do you want to allow HTML in them or not? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you you know, simple signatures could be broken down to something that's as simple as. Uh, plain text uh, to something that's has the giant animated uh, manga character to no <laughs> signatures at all. It's up to you. <laughs> it's right. um, so you know, as far as like a user of the forum is concerned, right? Because I mean, most people out there using vanilla are just you know they're commenting. They're not running their own, right? So as for, right. for the for the people who are who are using our forum, uh, what what in vanilla two is there to to excite them? You know, in terms of new features. So again, we've looked at a lot of what's going on in community and social network space, and, and we've grabbed a lot of these features that we think are just awesome. For example, um, at mentioning somebody. If you at mention somebody in a comment in vanilla, that person will get notified not only in their activity stream, but by email if it's in their preferences. Um, you can hashtag searches, so you can hash a word, and then that becomes a tag for, for a discussion. And those can be clicked on to run a search and see everything. Like we, we just we want to streamline the process so that what users are, are getting used to seeing on other sites is very much there in in vanilla. So, uh, and that that's not even touching on all the things that you can do with with um, all the plugins that we have available. I mean, vanilla two has only been out for four weeks, and even at the time of launch, there were already forty plugins written for it. Oh. Um, so the community is really getting ramped up. And and for me, the most exciting thing is just seeing. A, the, the plugins that get made for the software, because half the time people come up with stuff that we had no idea about, and, and it's really fascinating. But, but second of all, seeing how the users end up using it. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm excited to see what everybody thinks about it. And, and actually on our own forum, vanillaforums.org, our, our open source community forum, we're always throwing out plugins that people have made, whether it's us or people in the community, and, and testing them out and, and seeing how people react to them and, and, uh, and seeing how, how that drives usage. Um, and specifically related to that, we've even got a plugin that we've been working on in-house that we've got on some forums on our hosted uh, vanillaforums.com site that is specifically about tracking those statistics and finding out you know, who are the most active users and are they actually adding value or are they just putting a lot of content out there? And, <laughs> oh, and, uh, and you know, what are the most popular discussions during particular time ranges? And I don't know. It's a lot of fun and really interesting to look at your community in that way. Yeah. All right, so um, I know you sent out a little press release today that mentioned something about like a Vanilla Forums partner reseller program. Can you tell me yes. about that? Yeah, so um, like I said, we've got the .com hosting service right now, and and uh, you know, we're one of the things that we've realized is that um, first of all, growing, starting a community is very very difficult, um, and second of all, if even if you have an existing community, getting it over and, and moved across and, and gaining traction is still real, very difficult. But um, when, when we removed the, bound, the, bound, the boundaries that our users had of you know, getting the software, downloading it, getting it on a server, understanding how all those things work, you know, if you're technical enough to make it through that, then you can think about starting your forum. And with .com, we, we wanted to get rid of that whole process. So you just go and you fill out a, you know, a little form and you can create a form really quickly. Um, and then what we realize is that what happens is a lot of people come, they'll sign up, they'll create a form, they'll look around, and they'll be, you know, they won't have invested any time, so they'll be much more ready, ready to abandon it. And so we started talking to our existing users who were using the software, and we found that a lot of them were 
um, you know, graphic designers, programmers, contractors, or even straight up design firms. And they, you know, they have customers that need this stuff and, and, uh, and they were, they want to resell it. You know, we, they want to even be able to white label our software and, and then go to their clients and say, yes, we now offer this forum service. So this is the first step towards that. And, and, you know, enabling those people that are already engaged and want to start building on this, on the platform to, you know, have an incentive to do so, but also, you know, uh, make it an easy process for them. So basically it's a simple referral program and, and if you get, if you say know somebody who's running a, a discussion forum and you bring them onto our platform, you get 20% of the revenue that we get uh, for the entire time that that customer is with us. No, that's pretty cool. So, you, so if, I, if I get someone and they stick with vanilla for like forever, you know, because yeah. we've been using it for how many years? Oh, God, like since four, almost the beginning. Like four or five, right? So if they just keep yeah. paying, I just keep getting money, you know, that 20%. Absolutely. Absolutely, and yeah. And I mean, we're, we're also of the mindset that, you know, if you're, whether you're, it's you guys just doing something for fun or if it's you're actually a design firm and, and you need a form solution, you know, why shouldn't you make money off of that? You, and you, you're using the software, you're building with it, you should be making money. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so on some, you know, slightly less related things. Uh, so vanilla, I noticed it's made with PHP, right? Yep. Yep. So the, you know, I'm a, I'm a programmer. I work with uh, Python for a living. I used to do PHP stuff. I'm not one of those, you know, sort of zealot people who will say, oh, this is good and, and this is bad and you shouldn't mm -hmm. use, you know, but obviously there, there are many people <clears throat> who are PHP haters out there, you know, yep. uh, and it's, it's pretty much, you know, the, uh, the whipping boy of web development, at least if you read, you know, various uh, tech enthusiast sites. Yeah. So, you know, given that, what made you, you know, decide to stick with PHP or pick it in the first place? <laughs> so the dirty little secret of vanilla is that the first version of vanilla was written uh, in .NET. Oh, wow. Uh, so C Sharp. Okay. Um, and that was the first version that I tried to open source. And this was basically what, what was going on is the first version that was written not for release was all done with VBScript. And believe it or not, the very first version of it, which was probably written around 2001, had a, 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 a Microsoft Access database. So, like, this is going back a really, really long time for people <laughs> who know what ASP is. But I got hired by Microsoft to do um, .NET support when they released .NET to the world. And so I had sort of a, a little edge on, on what was going on with .NET before it even was released. And I was using it to do some test development um, for the support task that I was going to be doing at, my, at Microsoft. And I decided that I, was, I, lo I loved it. I loved C Sharp. It was, you know, very similar to Java. It was a lot of fun to write with. And, and let's face it, if you ever use Visual Studio, it's the best IDE in the planet. I, <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. Yeah, I'm a, they're they're IntelliSense. I is definitely amazing. have to agree. As an IT guy, I don't write a lot of software, but I'd write a soap service recently. And after banging my head against all the broken Python modules, .NET, I basically said, right click, make soap service done. Yes. Yeah, Visual Studio is, uh, you know, I'm a Vim, Unix kind of guy, but, you know, yeah. I've used Visual Studio to do XNA stuff, and I definitely, you know, I'm not down on it. Yeah, it's it's amazing. So so I, I just really wanted an excuse to keep on working with Visual Studio, and so <laughs> I did the first version in C Sharp. And, of course, when it came time to release it, uh, nobody wanted it because at the time, not only was there not a lot of .NET servers out there, uh, nobody knew how to use it. Nobody knew what it was. And I, you know, I, I don't even know if I tried to release it now would it get the pickup that it needs because let's face it, you know, you think open source, you don't think .NET. Um, well, I mean, even if the even if you give out something like that open source, let's say WordPress, you know, was written for .NET and was open source, you know, to be yeah. able to run it, you, you guess you could use Mono, and it's it's that's a huge pain, right? You would have yes. to you have to use what like Microsoft SQL Server and IIS, but those aren't really free, you know. So it's yeah. even though this one part is free, the rest of it isn't free. But if you do yeah. Any of the other, you know, an open source language, Python, Ruby, you know, Perl, PHP, whatever, you know, the the whole LAMP stack is the whole thing is free. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and I mean, so when it, when I realized that that wasn't going to fly, and I had to sort of abandon it, um, it wasn't the saddest part of my life. Like I, 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 at that, I've, I've never really, I, I didn't set out to make vanilla an open source project that made me money. Uh, back when I did it in two thousand five, I was just doing it because. I was, I'm a big freaking geek and I like to program and I wanted to program in any language and use any database and try any technology I could get my hands on. And so, you know, when I found out that that wasn't going to work and people didn't like it, they, they wanted the functionality. Um, they didn't want the language. So I 
I just looked around at what was available and, and I realized that LAMP works like PHP and MySQL can run on anything. And so that was the deciding factor. So Vanilla One was the first thing I ever wrote in PHP. Oh, wow. Actually, um, if, you look at, if you look at the code, it, it kind of might make sense that, um, you know, there's a lot of classes which at the time with PHP 4 didn't, didn't really make sense because it didn't scale. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the problems with Vanilla One is that as soon as it hit a large capacity of users, it, it really didn't scale well. Yeah, I had that. I had that problem also. It was like our forum got slow and slow. But then eventually, what I did is I just went into MySQL and I like indexed a whole bunch of you know the the columns. And then yeah. you know as soon as I did that, it was it was all right. Yeah, and even then, um, like we've had some very very big forums use use Vanilla One, and and you know we ha we did a lot of hacks to make it work well. And when we decided we were going to do Vanilla Two, and we were going to rewrite it all from the ground up, and we were going to go PHP Five, we knew that you know this time it'll be fast and just by the fact that it's php5 only it's faster but we've also ton done tons of optimizations from the lessons that we learned with vanilla one so what are so what are some of the like the biggest vanilla forums out there well the biggest one obviously that that we've we've ever seen out there in the wilds was the the firefox add-on site mm -hmm. um, i mean that's millions and millions and millions of people using that forum and the the sad part about it is that they customized it so much that you, you couldn't, couldn't even, tell. even tell it was yeah. vanilla. Um, so we really didn't get any credit at all, <laughs> which is fine. You know, that's open source too. Um, but we've also been talking to some bigger companies with millions of users that want to, want to use it now. And, and we're working on modules for vanilla two that, you know, some memcache modules and, and other kinds of caching oh, mechanisms. That would be pretty useful. I could use that. Yeah, and, and for our own purposes with our hosting services, you know, we've had to do a bunch of changes to the code, to, you know, to allow things like um, multi-server database selects and all this kind of stuff. So, so scaling is a big thing for us, for sure. Um, um, I, I'd love to mention one of the ones we're working with right now, but I, it's not locked in deal, so I can't do it right, right That's now. That's fine. Um, <laughs> So, you, so when you when you moved to PHP and gave up Visual Studio, what are you like using Eclipse or what do you what did you uh, move to? Yeah, that was a long, long, arduous road of what the hell ID should I use? Notepad. Um, <laughs> in the beginning, yeah, I, I, did, I did a lot of Notepad. I'm um, not a not really a Vim guy. Uh, one, actually, my favorite. If you're going con like straight up command line stuff, um, whenever I SSH to a server, the first thing I load up is Midnight Commander. Oh which wow. Is, if you guys know what Midnight Commander oh, is, yeah. it's sort of like Norton Commander <laughs> for Unix. And that has a really nice editor in it. If I'm doing live edits on the server, that's what I'm using. Oh, wow. Um, but if I'm doing straight-up development, uh, typically I'm running Komodo. Oh, okay. Uh, and, but it's weird. Like in my office, everybody runs something different. Nobody runs the same ID. Yeah, it's to say in my office, like one guy uses Xcode, one guy uses TextMate. I got Vim. It's, it's, uh, no one wants to do the same thing as anyone else. Yeah, we got one guy using NetBeans, another guy using... Um, uh, what's the company that does transmit? Uh, Coda. Oh yeah, the... which blows me away because there's no auto completion or anything. I don't know. Well, I think there is for classes, but there's not for PHP in classes. Anyway, right. I couldn't do it myself. All right, so so let's let's get away from from vanilla here. Get to the right? more fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because you said pretty <laughs> okay. much straight up, you're a big geek. So yes, <laughs> just about vanilla. Um. It's well, no. I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of things. I, I think it would be unfair for me to lie, but um, like so, video games, for example, big geek. Well, that's, a actually, loaded, that's a loaded statement. Video games, like what? What's the game you're playing right now? This is embarrassing, but um, Grand Theft Auto for online get play is like heroin to me. I can't get enough. I can't stop playing. <laughs> uh, as soon as, and I never ever put the headphones in. All I do is go online and, and make friends with somebody and then I'll drop a grenade under their car. <laughs> like I, I, just, I, love, I love the fact that you can go on there and uh, every once in a while I'll actually put the headphones in and I'll hear what they're saying and it's just a bunch of kids screaming um, <laughs> or else they're going to threaten that they're going to come get me. And that's my favorite thing is just to antagonize everybody in the game, preferably you know, as many players as possible until they're all after me. Oh well, it's it's so fitting that someone who's like a big uh, video game griefer would make an internet discussion forum, which is you know <laughs> pretty much you know the tool of of trolls everywhere. That's right. Well, that's another thing actually. So, trolls. I don't actually don't know if I want to give this away, but we've got a bunch of troll plugins for Vanilla Two that we've been working on. <gasps> we've wanted that forever. I wanted little funny things to do, like if someone gets flagged as a troll, they think they're mm -hmm. posting. They see their own posts, but no one sees their posts. Yeah, we've got that. Oh, oh we got man. that. Uh, 
I've actually yeah. we've we've thought of some other things. Like once a long time ago, years ago on Slashdot, there was like a tech demo of like a stupidity detector, and yeah. it, was, it was basically you would type any text into it. And if it thought that your post was like a stupid post, like if you just said, you know, first, it would detect yeah. it as stupid. But if you actually wrote a cohesion, you know, a, co uh, a oh, coherent, just... coherent sentence, it would say, okay, this post is not stupid. And I'm like, oh, I wish the forum would just automatically, you know, tell someone your post is stupid. We're not allowing it. Rewrite it. Stupid like tech de uh, typing detected. Yeah. Actually, that's a really good. We haven't we hadn't done that one because that's not so much trolling as it is just, you know, idiocy. Right. Well, that's something we do like the biggest thing in our forum that we use and we just kind of hack it we have moderators who can do it is yeah. we correct in line grammar and spelling really in anyone's post yeah it's funny like i i was talking to a guy recently who runs a really 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 big forum millions of users millions of people every day on it and they moderate every single comment in their forum well they must have like an army of, of moderators yeah there's they and they, all the moderators do it for free of course um yeah. But yeah, like I can't imagine going you through to that trust process. all those moderators too, because any one of them could be, you know. Yeah, and, and when when he told us this, I you know, I, it blew me away. But at the same time, I was like, "There's such a huge opportunity right there!" Like we just writing even the most rudimentary parser to figure out if something's bad or good, or even just looking for you know words that flag something as bad, and you know have a black and white list. They don't even have that. I mean, imagine wow. how much their workload could be reduced. So anyway. yeah, I mean that would also. There's a lot of sites out there that you know uh, have a requirement that they need to uh, moderate everything. Like newspapers, for example, whenever you try to comment on an actual newspaper, especially a local one, it's like they yeah. always moderate every single post that goes in. You know, actually, actually, it's funny you mentioned that. A friend of mine recently tweeted that um, apparently the very first newspapers in the states had pages for comments at the end, like blank pages. Oh wow. I don't understand how that possibly worked. <laughs> I guess you would. I guess you would write a comment and then you would leave the newspaper on the trolley and yeah, someone yeah, else so. would pick it up. So but, back in the day, did people just draw cock boats or like what did they do? <laughs> I don't know. They, they they drew a big animated flip book that was their signature, and you would flip through. <laughs> <laughs> so how about yeah, old games? Like, well, how did you get into gaming? Like, what was the first game you played that you recognized as a game? Like, your sentient mind was like, I am playing a game. Oh God! Um, like as in video game? Because I mean, obviously, tag. I mean, you're a kid. You're playing tag, but uh, <laughs> I think no, tag, the counts. First, tag counts. The first I video tag. game, I, the first video game I ever wrote, uh, or sorry, played, it was one that I wrote uh, in BASIC. Oh, uh, wow. My dad had one of those like original uh, computers that that had like a tiny little screen that you flip up and the keyboards underneath it. And do you it remember which no, model it was? I don't remember, oh. and and he threw it away. I think so. Uh, oh. um, but it had. Um, so it didn't have a hard drive. It just had a, a floppy, and it was one of those big, what were they, five and a quarters? Yep. <laughs> and and uh, so I turned it on. It would boot up, and I'd have to program my game, and I'd spend, you know, 45 minutes programming this stupid game. And then uh, I'd play it, and I'd be so exhausted and tired of it by then. I'd play it for like two minutes, and then I'd turn the computer off knowing that everything's getting erased. <laughs> <laughs> off. All that 45 minutes of code is just gone. That's how every good every good programmer started working on some old machine that only did basic. Yep, I had yeah. my TI-85. Yeah, I used Apple IIs so in school. You know. Basically, this was just, it was that stupid game where, you know, the block in the center is your car, and then the road's coming down. You know, like, the, there's two bars along the side that are going side to side, and you've got to steer your car down the road. Oh, that's a, that's a good game. Yeah. Did you, have, did you have turns and obstacles, or...? I, I was not that uh, no. that dedicated. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I did not. There were turns. It was zigzagging, right? But right. Uh, that's all. And Zaxxon, I think, was the first one I got really excited by. Three-dimensional. Wow. Oh, oh, Zaxxon. That's very good. So any non-video? Like, you ever play, like, D&D &D or, like, German board games, anything like that? Um, no. Uh, when, maybe when I was younger. Uh, actually, I, I did get into Magic the Gathering when I was in college. Oh. What so? What uh, sets were were out when at that time? Do you remember? Um, it was it was like they, they didn't have a lot of sets. This is like right in the very beginning. Oh, um, wow. And so, what was my best? I had a bunch of Sarah. Like I had an uh, like an angel deck. I had a bunch of Sarah angels. And uh, oh yeah, it was I had a like a white deck and a blue deck that was sort of munched together. And I had one those oysters that catch people and hold them at the bottom of the ocean. It's been a long time. <laughs> 
uh, it's all it's always interesting, you know, because we still we go to conventions and we still see kids playing Magic today, and we look at the cards they're playing with, and we don't recognize any of them. But occasionally, there's one card they got on the table that I I'm like, oh, I know that card, yeah, and every yeah, single yeah. person around you will have, will either still be playing or will have played, and they can tell you like I stopped playing at Fallen Empires, I stopped playing at the right. you know the Arabian Nights, and I you know. For me, it was one of those things. Like I think as, as soon as they started coming out with decks with other cards, period, and they were like, they stopped making the old ones. They started making these new ones, and they didn't make any sense to me, and they weren't very as powerful as the old ones. And I was like, this is BS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they, so yeah, I don't know. And, and in the end, what what it came down to is that I was in college and I needed beer money, and so I sold all my cards for <laughs> beer money. I wish I'd sold mine back when they were worth money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, they're still kind of worth money, just not you know. As not much. the four hundred dollar Black Lotus days. Yeah, no. Yeah. So if you and if you want to talk geek, so another thing that I sold for money um, was comics. I'm a huge comic nerd. Oh really? Ah. So what? So what? Do you still read comics like now? No, but I still have most of my good ones. Like I have a ton of Uncanny X Men from basically around the time Rogue came in to, um, I guess it would be around issue two. Forty two fifty something like oh, that. Wow, I, I was reading. I, I was have, in that like the three hundreds. Yeah, so. Oh yeah, I know. I've been, I, had, I had them like whoa, very old, and I also have uh, I have like the entire McFarland collection of Amazing Spider Man. <laughs> so from whenever he started, I, I can't yeah, that was the, that was the ni- early nineties, I think. Yeah, I have all those. I had I had uh, like all my the, all of Spawn, and I ended up selling Spawn number one to this comic shop for beer, and then I. Uh, I, this sounds bad that I sold everything for, for beer, but it was college. Come on. Um, <laughs> I guess it depends what kind well, of it was, beer. Well, it was college in Canada, right? <laughs> That's right. So were you getting, was it Labatt Blue you were drinking? <laughs> no, it was Pilsner. It was the Prairies. Oh, okay. Like Molson Pilsner. I don't oh, know we, that, In Rochester, all the Canadian hockey players, because we had a huge hockey team in Rochester, so all the, it was full of Canadian players from, you know, uh, from Toronto. Yeah, they were all like hotel management majors. Yeah, <laughs> and they would all, all they drank was Labatt Blue. You would see bottles of it like in big pyramids everywhere. Yeah, I know. In, in the prairies, it's it's a lot of Molson. Um, uh, what else they got? Labatt 50. A lot okay. of Labatt's and Molson, I guess. I don't know. They're all... Um, uh, it's weird. Like, from one part of Canada to the other, the beer is totally different. I mean, coming to Quebec, it's like a whole different country. No, say we... Um, yeah, so so you don't read comics anymore, though, right? So that's... no, but I still have them. They're and they're all individually wrapped and cardboard backed <laughs> and everything. I was a huge comic nerd. So why'd you stop reading? Beer money. <laughs> <laughs> money, yeah, it was purely money, and it was in, it was college, and I couldn't afford to buy them anymore. But yeah. now after vanilla, I mean, you're clearly a millionaire. So <laughs> <laughs> if I if I if I could make a a comic suggestion, right? There is um uh, Jeff Lemire wrote a series of comics called the uh, the Essex County Trilogy. Which will probably appeal to you because it's about it's wait you're, it, it's, it's set in Canada and written by a Canadian that's, that's all you got no it's also really awesome <laughs> <laughs> no but I, you yeah, know if you if you were, you know you'll have a you know a shared you know childhood experience with him possibly because he was all you know he's like also a comic reader same kind of person right cool so, um, I will check it out I guess that or I mean. Ever into Batman? Dark Knight Returns is pretty much like <laughs> <laughs> that's a different road of comics. I know. I think I got he probably it. knows about that. Yeah. One. Yeah, I heard of that one. <laughs> it's like, hey, have you heard of movies? You know, you should see the Star Wars thing. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. So I mean, you know, you're you're up in you're up in Montreal. It's not really like the big tech scene, right? I mean, usually it's it's San Francisco and stuff. I mean, we're in New York and we even get like flack for not being very technological. So do you does that like cause any problems for you or, or anything like that? Well, I mean, the way I look at it is first of all, Montreal actually has a really good startup scene right now. That's um good. so it's sort of on the turnaround here and there's actually a lot of money coming into the province right now, specifically into Montreal for for people who want to do startups in tech. Um, I recently went to uh, Vancouver just uh, a week or so ago to this conference called Grow. And um, it was basically an opportunity for U.S. investors and Canadian entrepreneurs to get together and talk about funding their companies. And for me, the most the best part about it was, and no offense to the investors, but meeting all the other companies from Canada. Because you know, Canada is so big and it's so spread out that half the time we don't even know about each other even though we're all up here and, and it's actually across the entire country you know a relatively small uh, group of, of techies and and there's actually some really really cool stuff going on and, and some of it is as close as like I met a ton of people from Ottawa and apparently there's a great startup scene in Ottawa and really cool stuff going on there 
Um, for example, I don't know if you heard of Shopify, but that's that's a big one out oh, of Oh yeah, Ottawa. I've thought about I've thought about using it. Yeah, yeah they're great. Um, and I met one of the founders of Shopify. He has another one that he's do, doing now called Swix, which is the social web index, which helps you to do all kinds of tracking of your campaigns across the social web, like crazy stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, Montreal is actually really good, and and the like I say, the the tech scene here is is really starting to blow up. There's events all the freaking time. I can't even keep up with them anymore. Oh, I should come um, up there. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And, and hey, if you do come up, let me know and you can come to the vanilla office. We'll hang out. Oh, man. Right. Awesome. Yeah. I guess we've we got some place to go on vacation now. So <laughs> we do have to ask because you do live north of the Messier line. You a hockey fan? Yeah, you know, that's. I, I'm almost <laughs> embarrassed to be ca Canadian because I totally am not. I'm not a sports fan <laughs> at all. Uh, don't watch any sports of any kind, only uh, into total geekery. Uh, my co founder is a huge sports fan, but it just. I, I don't even understand what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> uh, I'm like failing at being Canadian by saying that. That's all right. I, yeah. You know, I mean, not everyone in the U.S. is, you know, uh, whatever stereotype of the U.S. you want to name. <laughs> Especially us. <laughs> well, well said. <laughs> so you said you were a geek and you said specifically geeks. I'm just curious because it seems like different parts of the world, they use the words differently. Do you think there's any difference between a geek and a nerd? Or do you just use them interchangeably? Yeah, I don't know. A nerd. I, I I can't help but think of Revenge of the Nerds, and and that's they're they're just not cool. <laughs> you know, a geek a geek can be really smart and really cool. Half the time, even if a geek is a pretentious jerk, you still want to know them because they're really smart and they think about stuff a lot and they can say amazing things that blow your mind. Whereas a nerd is just an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> like I knew lots of nerds in college who. Who you know they were into comics and stuff like that too, but then they'd come out of an exam and be like, "Hey, how did you do that exam?" And like, "Oh, you know, high eighties, high nineties," and then they failed. You know. Oh, so really? Wow. That to me is a nerd. Wow. That to us is a is a is a I think a dork. Dork, maybe a dweeb. <laughs> hard to say. Yeah. Isn't that the same thing as a nerd? I guess a nerd for us is someone who is, you know, at least for us, it's it's uh, well, like, like the guy, the guy, uh, Steve Urkel is a nerd, right? He has no social skills. You don't really want to be near him. He's annoying, but yep. he could make a rocket and it would work because he actually knows, you know, right? A geek can make ninety percent of the rocket and he's totally cool. Yeah. So like Screech would be a nerd then. Yeah, probably. See, I don't. Okay. I, I would go more broad. We always the, the definition we use on the show, at least, because you know, it's geek nights, is then our whole like focus is that a nerd has depth of focus in one area or maybe a couple areas and like right. the, like if there's a spider graph of their life there's like these gigantic spikes going way way out yeah but a geek is like they have depth of interest in many fields like they have this depth and breadth kind of combined yeah yeah you know it's weird like since since i took the the plunge and tried to turn vanilla into a business um started about I guess two years ago, I decided that I, I wanted to stop working for other people and just do open source stuff. Um, and at that time, I realized as time got, went by that I had to cut out a lot of other things that I was passionate about in life to make room for all the stuff that I had to learn. Yeah. I mean, Tell going me from being a straight up developer to being somebody that, you know, I'm a, I'm a CEO now. I have board meetings. I got oh. to know about financials. I got to know about um, marketing, you know, business development. Uh, these are all things that, that, you know, they're very, very nerdy and geeky, but in a totally different way. And I had to sort of push room out, out of my brain to, to move into other things. Like for, I w at the time that I decided to do this move, I just started to learn how to play guitar. And it was another one of those things I was picking up, I was getting better at, and I had to drop it. Um, and again, oh, I don't know. Like my I don't regret to... in life is, is a guitar. Dude, if you're a true geek, you'll learn. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's weird. It's like well, I, I played it when I was... had some trouble with the harmonica, which was kind of a <laughs> test to see if he could get the guitar. Well, I, play, I played the guitar in fifth grade, and then I stopped because I went to middle school. In middle school, I joined the band and played the clarinet, and I couldn't play two at once, right? Right, right, so, right. And then after middle school, I stopped playing the clarinet also, so then it was nothing. And yeah. then later on, I was like, you know, I made a big mistake. I should have stuck with the guitar the whole time because if I had stuck with it all the way through college, I would have been like a rock star already, right? Right. With that many yeah, years... Yeah. But then I was like, okay, as soon as I had money, I was like, all right, I should buy a guitar. But wait, 
what if I don't actually practice? I'll just waste money and I'll see the guitar sitting there, you know, making me feel guilty every day. Eventually you'll see it on eBay. Yeah. So I was like, I know I'll buy a cheap instrument. And if I have the discipline to practice it, that means that I'll also have the discipline to practice the guitar. Of course, part of the trouble was you said harmonica. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do it too. But I played music all my life. I almost became a professional trumpet player. So I was like, I was rocking it. Yeah, so I bought a harmonica, and then I did not have the discipline to practice it. So I said, well, I guess a guitar will just sit there making me feel guilty, so I will not buy one. That harmonica make you feel guilty? No, because it was only five bucks. Well, no no offense to harmonica players, but how can you feel cool playing a harmonica? I mostly play by myself. feel cool playing a guitar. Even if you don't know what you're doing, like if say a deaf person's walking by and they see you strumming on a the guitar, they're like, that guy's cool. <laughs> not, not in New York City, where half the people with guitars just sort of, you know... <laughs> got a bucket they were looking for spare change and they don't know how to play anything and <laughs> yeah anyway anyway i, I digress yeah. uh it's it's uh same for so for that reason i mean I, I don't have enough time to dedicate to video games i bought all these games because i get excited about them and then I, I, like left for dead i really wanted to play it i played it a little bit i had and a few was already left for dead too <laughs> yeah i know i but i'm i didn't even i haven't even had time for left for dead 2 i've only done left for dead 1 and mm. again, I, I honestly, I actually had to stop playing that one because it gave me nightmares. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> so I, for some reason, zombies terrify me. Uh, I don't know why. And, and actually, I just read World War Z by uh, Max Brooks. I've heard about that. Yeah. If, well, you should read that book. It is amazing. Um, and it's, again, there's another re- reason that I'm geeky. I read a ton of um, geeky books. Ooh. Like that. Are you got any any book recommendations besides? Uh, yeah, World we have War the Geek Z? Nights book club. We get people to read like Ray Bradbury, Prince of Nothing, all these crazy books. Um, well, actually, this is gonna sound weird, but um, my wife made me read uh, the Time Traveler's Wife, and I know, like, I was like, really, you're gonna make me read this? It just sounds so lame. And then they made the movie. This is she made me read it before the movie, but I was like, that's actually like a, a kick-ass book that uh, you know, written by a woman, and and it's. It comes across like some kind of sci-fi thing by a guy. I don't know. It, it was really cool and not what you expect. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kind of hardcore. Huh. Oh, very nice. And the movie just like softened it up and it was total cheese ball. So don't watch the movie. Duly noted. <laughs> as, as can often happen. Um, what are you reading right now? Hmm? Sorry, I don't have my books right in front of me. So, Well, Irvin Welsh. I'll just, I'll just throw that out there. Read anything by Irvin Welsh. Wikipedia. All right. <laughs> so Irvin Welsh is the guy that, that wrote Train Spot Train Spotting. Oh, 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 yeah. And and so like his books, if you can if you can make it through one of his books, then you can make it through all of his books. Uh, he he has a very strange way of writing, and half the time he uses that Scottish slang, so you it takes a, a while to understand what the hell they're talking oh, about. Oh, well, that that could be really fun though, because when you watch the movie with the slang, you don't really yeah. get all of it. But if I could read yeah. it. I, I yeah, feel yeah. like I could go slowly and learn it and actually maybe you reuse it. You gonna learn Pikey? Maybe. And if you if you like train spotting, um, he's made a sequel to it called Porno, which is <laughs> way, way better than train spotting was. And and apparently Ewan McGregor has been saying that he's never gonna do this. He he hates porno, he thinks it was a horrible sequel and blah 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 blah. But um and they say they're not gonna make the sequel unless he d- agrees to do it. So it's kind of dead in the water. But um uh, it's it's amazing. It's so funny. And if you like Francis Begbie, you know Begbie. Um, if I don't know, can we swear on this show? Yeah, yeah. So you can say whatever you want. <laughs> okay. So uh, in in Train Spotting, he's the one. He's playing pool and he throws this his mug or his, his pint of beer over the balcony. It goes and smashes some girl in the head. And then there's like mayhem downstairs as everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. And he comes down the stairs and he goes, "Some cunt glass lasse." And no cunt leaves till we find out what cunt done it. <laughs> but he screams at him and he headbutts him and breaks his nose. He's a crazy guy. And in, in porno, he goes absolutely wild. It is, it is an amazing book. I had to, had to put that on a list here. So how about, notice how we started very specific and we draw out now. So movies. Now, the, the lame question anyone would ever ask, like, what's your favorite movie? Because it's just a crap question to try to answer. So, I don't know, what are, like, three movies that you like? Well... You know what? When we were just talking about sequels, there it reminded me of um, I, I'm a huge Mad Max nerd, and uh, Uh-oh. and now they're making Mad Max Fury Road. I don't know if you know about that yet. Uh oh. Actually, I just learned so, there's a Mad Max convention in Southern California where if you're not dressed up like a mod Mad Max character, they don't let you in. That's hilarious. It's set no, like I out in the that. desert. It's well, there's also it's, the guy in Australia who like made a Mad Max whole like his whole uh, his whole property is Mad. He Max, basically right? lives Mad Max. That yeah. guy. That's crazy. Um, 
the guy, you know, Inception, the movie Inception. Yeah. Yep. So the there was the the guy in that who was also in a movie called Bronson, a British guy, more a little more like beefier. Tom Hardy. Anyway, he's going to be the new Mad Max in Mad Max Fury Road. Oh, so it's not uh, Melvin Gibstein? No, well, I mean, I think he's a little out of shape. Right yeah, now. possibly. Yeah, a little old looking. <laughs> Caught a bit of the guy, he's got some other troubles too. Lately. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Probably, okay, favorite movie. Hang on, my wife's sitting right here and she's a better memory than me. Sarah, what's my favorite movie of all time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, she she says Wizard of Oz. That's her favorite movie. Come on. <laughs> um, not the sequel? I don't know. No, definitely not. Not as villain as those. Yeah, Dumb and Dumber. That's probably it. <laughs> I, I've watched Dumb and Dumber probably a million times. I can't help it. It's just it. It never gets old. That's fine. I, 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 there's stupid movies I watch over and over again too. Stupid movies are the best. Like yeah. Airplane, classic. Oh, I keep Airplane. Top Secret lately. Oh my God, Top Secret! I should watch that again. Yeah, That's I've, I've never movie. seen it. What? <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> Bro, oh, really? Really? Not everyone's I'm, seen everything. Everyone's seen everything. No. Okay. Have I just aged myself. No, I've no. seen it. Everyone's seen it except Scott, apparently. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Big nerd. So uh, I'm into lots of TV shows, too. We actually, a couple of years ago, I, I uh, as soon as I discovered what you could do with Torrance, I'm not going to say what that is that you can do with Torrance. <laughs> That's but fine. I will say that the result of this, that discovery is that I, I disconnected my cable television. And we we never... also have not had cable television since 2001. Yeah, about the same here. Yeah. And and so as a result of that, I it's changed the way I I take in media of all forms. Uh, now it's all uh, da- I'm not going to say I download it, but uh, it's just there's no more commercials. Let's put it that way. <laughs> 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 and you know, instead of sitting down and waiting every week to watch a TV show, you you decide, oh, so there's been seven seasons of Bones. All right, I'm going to watch all of that this weekend. Mm-hmm. You know, Which you said is, you like Mad Max. Have you ever watched a show called uh, Fist of the North Star? Yes, of course I've seen Fist of the North Star. <laughs> oh, man, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've seen lots and lots of anime. And actually, if you want to get into really geeky stuff, when I was in college, uh, we used to go to these, um, like when Chan, Jackie Chan was first coming out with like Super Cop and, and all those ones, um, Operation Condor, remember that? Oh, wow. Uh, those were Rumble some, in the Bronx? Yes, yeah. Rumble in the Bronx. And there's a ton of ones like, there was one like Sergeant Kabuki Man or something like that. Like, <laughs> there's all these weird Japanese movies that came out that are, that are just amazing. Uh, like, of course, Drunken Master. You 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 yeah. have to have seen Drunken Master. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I assume you've seen then Iron Monkey. Yes. Yeah. How about uh, Attack the Gas Station? I have not seen uh, that. No one's ever <gasps> seen Attack the Gas Station. Uh, this movie have, is so up your alley. I have a feeling Attack the Gas Station will be one of your favorite movies. Right on. It's a, it's have you a, guys seen? Have you seen that? Um, it was like a sh- a, a short uh, sitcom thing that was made for the internet. I'm pretty sure they say it as a pilot, but I don't think it actually was. With Jack Black and Owen Wilson. Um, I thought he was going to talk about Tokyo Breakfast. <laughs> so <laughs> no, 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 no. This is like, for some reason, when we're just talking about these these weird, like funny special effects and wacky premises, it reminded me of this this uh, show, which was about um, Jack Black was a, a cop. Uh, who, or like an FBI agent or something. Anyway, he got too close. To, he's a space uh, spaceman. He got too close to the sun, and it changed his brain, and, and it made him super smart at at uh, in the daylight and and really dumb at nighttime or something like that. And his, <laughs> his that's sidekick, okay as long as you just sleep all night, you'll be you'll be just fine. His sidekick is a motorcycle played by Owen Wilson. Um, <laughs> if you have if you don't, I, I'm gonna have to find out what this is and, and give it to you because it is the funniest freaking ridiculous sitcom you'll ever see. That sounds I'm pretty good. Uh, I definitely want right to check up the, it out. right off that alley, though, of, of crazy premise and, and dumb special effects and stuff. <laughs> yeah, Attack the Gas Station is a, is a Korean movie, and basically uh, the story is you have some delinquent kids. Well, they're not really kids. They're a little bit older, you know, yeah. and they didn't go anywhere in life. And they're sitting it's, eating some noodles, and they say, hey, what do you want to do? We're bored. They say, hey, let's attack the gas station. So they go rob the gas station. And then right. it's just a pretty mundane, you know, robbery, you know. Yeah. And then uh, the movie cuts, and they're in the noodle shop again, and they're bored again. And he says, hey, what do you want to do? Let's attack the gas station again. And then opening credits. And then, and- yeah, the second time they attack the <laughs> gas station is far more eventful than the first time. Right. Uh, you know, 90 minutes eventful. Oh, okay, okay, I see. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's pretty good. I'm interested. I'm going to have to get that. Yeah. I've never met a person who didn't love that movie. <laughs> At least the first showing. 
Is there anything else that you you know you want to uh, say that we did not give you an opportunity to say? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so my name is Marco Sullivan. I'm the founder of, a, of Vanilla Forums, which is open source forum software that powers discussion on hundreds of thousands of sites around the web. You can download Vanilla at vanillaforums.org, and you can set up a Vanilla Forum in just a few seconds at vanillaforums.com. So check us out. Start right. your community. Actually, I just thought of, of one more or two more questions, right? It used to be called Lucimo, right? What, what happened to Lucimo? Ah, I thought I was going to avoid that one. Uh, uh, that's, is that's, it not a fun question? It's, uh, it's, it's an embarrassing question. Okay. So, so basically, I bought, you know, back in the day when people just bought domain names for the hell of it, I guess they still do, but they were a lot easier to get back then. Um, I had a ton of domain names, and that was one of the ones that I bought, and I ended up using it for um, I, I, a site I made for my wife, not my girlfriend at the time, but wife now, for Valentine's Day. And it um. was La Sumo, that's how I pronounced it, La Sumo, was our oogly googly talk to each other, and it means love you more. <laughs> As in, La Sumo, no, I La Sumo. <laughs> oh my god it's embarrassing but um so when i made vanilla i i was trying to sort of go for this i don't know weird like here's the brand that owns multiple products because vanilla was going to be the first one and there was actually, the file browser right file browser was i actually, actually use the file browser still uh oh really yeah i guess it's weird some people still have it out there but i kind of felt like once once things like Flickr became you know, more commonplace and yeah. And the thing, is, the reason I use it still is because, um, well, actually, the, you know what? Actually, I used to. I was using Flickr, but Flickr is really only good for your photos that you want to share with people, right? But sometimes yeah. you want to post an image, usually to then post it in a forum, and I need yeah. to host it somewhere. But I want to host it on Flickr, so yeah. I just upload it to my server, and then I had the file browser there, so I could find old ones if I needed to re, you know, just to get a link to them. Yeah. But yeah, now no, I think Imgur is actually have made that sort of obsolete. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's Imgur, and then there's also like we're actually doing some stuff for our .com hosted forums where you can upload files now. And the first stage was just getting the files uploaded, and now we're going to have little media repositories. So anybody who uploads files, you know, they have a little page they can go to to grab the links and all that kind of stuff oh, and look good. at the files. Um, but uh, so yeah, that's where the name came from. I I, I needed to use something to ha umbrella over these products, and I had that one laying around, so I used it, and then. Over the years, it just became more and more difficult to try to explain to people, first of all, what it means, but even more importantly, how the hell do you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, I didn't even was, think about the pronunciation until just now when I got it wrong. Yeah, and then when, you know, and the other turn, turn, take it the other way and say, "Oh, my domain name is lessimo.com," and everybody's like, "Okay," and then they, everybody spells it wrong. Oh, uh, <laughs> spells it a different way. That's for uh -huh. sure. See, what you can do is make a legend of Krauser, and every time you get interviewed, give a different story, and then no one will ever know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, anyway, it's it's sort of gone by the wayside. We we just realized that Vanilla was the name that stuck, and it was a name that everybody recognized. And you know, we had some good domain names for it, and it just didn't make sense to hold on to the other one. So we just dropped it. All right. Yeah. Okay. I think that's uh, that's pretty much it. Thanks a lot for uh, coming on the show. It was a good time. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This is fun. Yeah. We'll definitely uh, talk again in the future. Perhaps. If we yeah. Let me, let me know uh, when, it, when this goes online and where I can find it. And it'll probably, uh, it, we normally would have gone online today, but we're going to, to PAX this week. So it'll probably be Monday next week, I guess. Yeah. Okay. We got like two panels. I got to finish making maybe the Monday, slides. Maybe Monday and... next week. Uh, you know, maybe after. We don't know. Are you guys going to um, Blog World in Vegas? Uh, I didn't even know there was a such thing as Blog nah, World We're going in to Vegas. the Penny Arcade Expo. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. I'm just like, if if there's any opportunity to hook up, we should. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. absolutely. If you want to go to um, PAX East, it's in <laughs> Boston. Next. Kineticon, we're trying to get a big tech presence at. Yeah, we could, you know, we're we're in charge of the, the, the programming at, well, not all the programming, but the panels programming at Kineticon. So maybe we could get them, to, you could be like a guest or something. Yeah, yeah that'd be cool. When, when When is it? Uh, like next year. It's in the middle of the summer in Hartford, oh. Connecticut. <laughs> Cool. Well, I guess keep me keep me up to date. Yeah, we'll, it's a little we'll bit. Say. We only get like seven thousand people. It's not like the biggest convention. Yeah, but. seven thousand is big. No, not really. Oticon, oh, like big. the anime con we go to out here, is thirty thousand. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, and the, that's something else you have to real. Uh, something else you have to realize. Like you look at San Diego Comic Con, right? It's big and yeah, famous, yeah. and they'll yeah. tell you an uh, an attendance number like a hundred thousand. They're mm -hmm. actually lying because what they do is they're actually giving you a turnstile count. So if someone oh, goes, wow. if someone goes to all three days and preview night, so it's Wednesday night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 
They count that yeah. person five times. So right. the you know San Diego Comic Con is the biggest, but the true attendance number is probably between forty and fifty thousand. Yeah, I mean our little con by if we count it the way like all the Vegas cons count is like twenty thousand people. Yeah. Right. Right. But we're yeah you know, when we count we're actually counting the number of unique individuals. So a weekend pass counts as one, and a Saturday pass counts as one. The only time we would mess up counting is if somebody bought a Saturday pass and a Sunday pass. We might count them twice and mess up. I but, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's much closer to, and plus sometimes they count the vendors and don't even get me started. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Now we're actually done. I got to go eat dinner. Okay. All right. Cool. Have All a right, good cool. one. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you. All right. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>